learn to let go. Holding on to something that God is saying has come to an end is painful. And that process of holding on will hurt you. And if it doesn't hurt you, then it will plant seeds. Seeds of bitterness, seeds of resentment and unforgiveness. That's what will begin to build up in your heart. That's how Satan wants you to react. How could they do this to me? After all I did for them, how could they just treat me like that? You see, it's thinking like that that'll cause you to become disheartened. You induce yourself into a state of suffering when instead you just need to let them go respectfully, quietly, gracefully. Let them go. Don't waste time fighting about it. Don't argue about it. God brought them. He'll bring someone else. And when you find yourself in a position where you need the grace to accept that someone has served their purpose, pray that the Lord will be your comfort as he guides you into the next chapter. We don't always know what's best for us. It can be hard to see reality clearly when our emotions get in the way. That's why we need to pray for the grace to be of a clear mind. We will meet a lot of people over our lifetime. Without a doubt, there will be many that we will grow fond of, some that we'll be sad to let go of, others not so much. But we have to trust that God knows what he's doing. He knows what will help us. He knows what will harm us. And in the grand view of eternity, in the grand scheme of our beginning and our end, he knows it all, what is needed to develop our character, who is needed to take us to the next level, and also who should be removed so that we can be free to elevate. We don't always have control over the people who influence our lives. We can't always beg them to stay or force them to leave. But what we can control is our attitude. The Bible says, As much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Living peaceably means letting go of anger. It means letting go of malice. It means letting go of regret. It means letting go of what could have been and looking forward to what's ahead. God has so many relationships in store for you that you might not even know about yet. Don't miss out on the opportunities he's preparing for you because you're too focused on preserving something that was never going to last. And don't try to bury your emotions, but bring them to God in prayer. He knows your hurt. He knows your pain. Jesus himself was betrayed by the ones he loved. He understands your reluctance, but he will also give you the strength to do the hard things you need to do. Pray for wisdom as well. It can be hard to determine when to stay and when to let go. But at some point, it becomes clear when it's not meant to be. If a relationship no longer glorifies God, but instead glorifies itself, it's time to move on. It's time to look forward. So if God removed them from your life, don't be afraid to let them Go. So look at your own life. What can happen if you didn't hold on to the expectation of others? What happens? What happens when you release the negative and hateful expectations from others and in exchange embrace God's expectations over your life? When people expect you to fail, Stand on Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ. What happens when people expect you to amount to nothing? Well, you stand on Jeremiah 29, where God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. When people expect you to fall, when your enemies expect to defeat you, 
You stand on Psalm 91 verse 7. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but danger will not come near you. No one's expectation matters but God's and God's alone. No one can anticipate or expect the plans that God has for you. So stand in the expectation of God, but never of man. Adversity exposes your attitude towards God. Sometimes you need to come up against opposition just to find out if the word of God really lives in your life or if your belief is easily shaken by the slightest bit of wind. There's a saying that goes, life is like a wheelbarrow. You get nowhere until you start pushing. So press on, keep pushing, endure, keep running the race, get up and get off your back, get on your feet and press on. You have the victory through the Lord. You are triumphant with the blood of Jesus. You are destined to stand in the winner's circle. Quit feeling sorry for yourself and live like God intended for you to live. As a man thinks, so is he. Stop saying, I can't, and start saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Stop saying if all the time. Start speaking and saying, I will by the grace of God. If you feel like you're under pressure, if you feel like you're under fire, know that God can and will order your steps in such a way that he will bring things into your life that will bless you, protect you, and guide you through that storm which may intimidate you. So start believing that whatever it is that's been holding you back is about to break. That wall which has blocked you is about to break. That closed door of opportunity is about to open. That very thing you've been seeking in prayer concerning your family is about to become a reality. Have faith in God. Press on. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. We can sometimes find ourselves facing what seem to be giants. Giants everywhere. Giant oppositions, giant inconveniences, giant opportunities, and at times we can feel outmatched and outskilled. We can feel intimidated and overwhelmed, but I want you to know that God has granted within each and every one of us an amazing gift, a gift that resides within, and it's awakened when you come into Christ a gift that sets you apart as a child of God. It gives you an advantage in the midst of everything that you face. During an attack from the devil, it may look like he is bigger than you. It may look like he is stronger than you, but looks can be deceiving because what you have inside of you is greater than what's in the world. You've been divinely created with a purpose. God is a God of intentionality. He's created you strategically, crafted you with a purpose, and resident within you is everything you need to carry out God's purpose and to be everything he's called you to be. Understand, people of God, that in life, there is a giant with your name on it, a giant that you are called to defeat, a Pharaoh that you are to overcome, but only if you tap into the it that God gave you, not the it that the world wants you to be, not the it that you kind of, sort of think about, but tap into the gifts, the it that God gave you. That's why it's so important to find wholeness in God and not in other people. Only God can validate you, not people. Sometimes in life, God gives us people who aren't meant to stay. People who come to play their part and the role they play in our lives can be powerful. They might be a mentor, they may be a friend, they might even be an opposer, someone who challenges you but inadvertently pushes you 
to do better, to be better at your craft, better in your performance. All people have an appointed time and season. All people will serve a purpose in your life according to God's will. But what we need to realize is that not everyone we love is meant to be in our lives forever. Not every friend will always be a friend. Look back over your own life. How many friends did you have years ago who are still friends today? They came and served a purpose whether you liked it or not. They came for an appointed time and season. You see, none of us were born saved. None of us were born as little saints. We all have been involved with people that we shouldn't have at one point or another in our lives. You've had a friend who you knew was no good for you. You've been with a guy who had red flags all around him. And you've been with a girl who you knew was trouble. We've all been involved at some level with people or with a person who was bad for us. Now the strange thing is, have you ever noticed that it's those people, the ones with red flags, the ones who are trouble, it's those people that are the hardest to get rid of in our lives. And I mean, when you look at the long-term impact they have on us, the long-term negative impact they have on us, it should be an easy decision to let them go. But that's never the case. So, might I suggest that sometimes God allows you to struggle and tussle with these toxic people, with these toxic friends, so that you may learn a lesson so that you might learn not to invest your time and energy in people who drain you rather than support you. Maybe God has allowed you to see what those red flags look like in a man so that when the man that God has for you comes around, you are not confused, you are not second guessing, you can clearly identify a man of God versus a man of bad intentions. And these lessons can be hard to learn. But the point I'm trying to put across to you is that God put specific people in our lives for purpose, and when He removes them. If God removed someone from your life, let them go. Don't try to hold on to them when their appointed time comes to an end. If they are walking, let them walk. What God has for you will never pass you by. Learn to let go. Holding on to something that God is saying has come to an end is painful. And that process of holding on will hurt you. And if it doesn't hurt you, then it will plant seeds. Seeds of bitterness. Seeds of resentment and unforgiveness. That's what will begin to build up in your heart. That's how Satan wants you to react. How could they do this to me? After all I did for them, how could they just treat me like that? You see, it's thinking like that that'll cause you to become disheartened. You induce yourself into a state of suffering when instead you just need to let them go respectfully, quietly, gracefully. Let them go. Don't waste time fighting about it. Don't argue about it. God brought them. He'll bring someone else and when you find yourself in a position where you need the grace to accept that someone has served their purpose, pray that the Lord will be your comfort as he guides you into the next chapter. We don't always know what's best for us. It can be hard to see reality clearly when our emotions get in the way. That's why we need to pray for the grace to be of a clear mind. We will meet a lot of people over our lifetime. Without a doubt, there will be many that we will grow fond of, some that we'll be sad to let go of, others not so much. But we have to trust that God knows what He's doing. He knows what will help us. He knows what will harm us. And in the grand view of eternity, in the grand scheme of our beginning and our end. He knows it all, what is needed to develop our character, who is needed to take us to the next level, and also who should be removed so that we can be free to elevate. 
We don't always have control over the people who influence our lives. We can't always beg them to stay or force them to leave. But what we can control is our attitude. The Bible says, As much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Living peaceably means letting go of anger. It means letting go of malice. It means letting go of regret. It means letting go of what could have been and looking forward to what's ahead. God has so many relationships in store for you that you might not even know about yet. Don't miss out on the opportunities he's preparing for you because you're too focused on preserving something that was never going to last. And don't try to bury your emotions, but bring them to God in prayer. He knows your hurt. He knows your pain. Jesus himself was betrayed by the ones he loved. He understands your reluctance, but he will also give you the strength to do the hard things you need to do. Pray for wisdom as well. It can be hard to determine when to stay and when to let go. But at some point, it becomes clear when it's not meant to be. If a relationship no longer glorifies God, but instead glorifies itself, it's time to move on. It's time to look forward. So if God removed them from your life, don't be afraid to let them Go. If I had to tell you my story, I would have to tell you that there was a time that I hit rock bottom. There was a time where I was flat broke, no hope, and things weren't looking bright for me. And to make matters worse, do you know what I did at that time? In my anger, in my rebellion, I turned my back on God. Where I should have been patient, I was rash and acted out of my own will. Where I should have had faith and let God be in control, I tried to control things. I did things my own way and chose the broad road because I felt there wasn't enough room on the straight and narrow road. And for anyone who has ever tried to do things their way instead of God's way, when you do something when you know good and well that that's not God's will for your life, Let me say from experience that it never works out. Ask Jonah, how did it work out for him when he tried to outrun God's calling? And so for me, life happened. After I ran, after I pulled away, after I ignored the conviction of the Holy Spirit in my heart, the Lord finally allowed a series of events that brought me to my knees. I was stuck in a situation where I knew, I knew deep down, that I had to turn to Jesus. Life made me chase and seek after a power that is bigger than anything I had access to. My problems, as many as they were, made me seek divine intervention. Have you ever been in a place where nothing seems to be working and you know only Jesus can get you out of this place? A place where no natural resources, no doctor, no psychologist amount of therapy, no friend can get you out of this situation, but only Jesus Christ. That's where I was, (laughs) where I once stood tall and relied on my own skills, my own resources. Life took me to the feet of the Lord asking for forgiveness, begging for mercy. I wasn't worthy, but I was still loved. I wasn't faithful, but I was still forgiven. And for anyone else who may be going through what I went through, for anyone else who may need this word of encouragement, I want to tell you that although you may be hard pressed on every side, but you're not crushed, you might be discouraged, but you're not destroyed. Although you're perplexed, You have not been driven to despair. The bottom line is, regardless of how bad or messed up you think your situation is, you are not forsaken. Remember what the word of God says about you. His plans for you are good. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So let me tell you, you are valuable. 
You are of more value than many sparrows. You've been saved by grace. You've been justified by faith. You see, you need to get to the point where you stop running from the call of God. There must come a time when you, as a believer, must decide. I will stand strong on my godly convictions. I will stand for forgiveness even when it's hard. I will stand in faith even when I can't see a way out. You may be under attack in your health. Maybe the attack is within your family or marriage. Even under attack, pray that the Holy Spirit will strengthen you. So I'm speaking to you, child of God. It's time to take a stand with the word of God against the forces of evil. Stand in the authority of Christ, your Savior. When you stand and wait on the Lord, he will renew your strength. He will rescue you. Can I take a moment to tell you about my own personal revelation? In Matthew 19, verse 21, Jesus said the following words, If you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When I came across this, I received the message that I am to leave certain things behind, which are of no benefit to me in my walk with Jesus. And it's not just a case of leaving anything for the sake of it. I believe it's leaving those things which compete or rival God for your heart. For some, it is indeed money and material possessions. For others, it's a private sin. And for me, I had to look deep at what was holding me back. I had to find those things and really say, I'm leaving you behind so that I can follow Jesus. Anything draining and everything toxic had to go. Any bitterness from the failures of the past, all the hurt and the pain, I had to leave it all behind. Every disappointment, Every wrong decision, it all had to take its place behind. And yeah, the devil has tried to condemn me. He's tried to remind me of all the times I've fallen. All the times I've come up short in sin. He's tried to plant thoughts of doubt and discouragement. But I know he is an accuser. And I know that I have confessed my sins. I've repented it and I've asked for forgiveness. And I have been forgiven. I have been set free. Those doubts, those sins, those times I've fallen short, I'm leaving it all behind. And I'm not talking about living a life of perfection. I'm talking about striving for a life of progression. Progressing from my old ways. Progressing in my pursuit of a stronger relationship with God. Progressing with a deeper understanding of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about everything on a new level. My prayer life has to be different. My faith has to be stronger and bolder. My worship has to be different. The God in me must be seen outwardly. Even my personal prayer list, my goals, I'm asking big, I'm believing big, and I want to encourage you to do the same too. Start that business believing that God will make it work for you. Study hard and take school seriously. Believing God for all of the skill, wisdom, and knowledge you need. Take your marriage to another level, believing God for a complete turnaround. If it's a job or your finances, tell God about it and believe He will make a way. If it's your health and you need healing, tell God about it. If you're stuck in some bad circumstance, tell God about it. And if you're encouraged, that's good. But that's not to say you won't come face to face with challenging tests. But even so, don't get distracted. Don't get discouraged. Don't quit. Don't waver to the left or to the right. God's not going to leave you out to dry. He won't leave you alone. But like the book of Joshua chapter 1 says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God is with you, so keep your eyes on him and look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Sometimes God breaks your heart to save you. And what we mean when we say that is, we don't always know what's best for us. We can think we know, 
we can think that if we don't get this one thing, then our lives will never be complete. But that's not how God operates. When God says no to you, He usually has something better in mind. When it feels like your blessing, your breakthrough has been delayed, God usually knows the perfect time to release that which you desire. In His love and in His care and mercy, the Lord wants you to be saved. He wants you to spend eternity with Him. But all too often, we as people are so focused on these worldly desires that if we don't receive what we want, when we want, we begin to doubt and question. But I want to encourage you today to look at the bigger picture. John 14 verse 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. That's the bigger picture we should hold on to. During one of the hardest times in my life, I was asked a strange question. Who told you that you would never go through tough times just because you're born again? Who told you that you would never have problems now that you're a Christian? Tough questions, right? Never have the mindset that if you're in the will of God, you'll never face any trouble. Jesus was in the will of God, and yet he still went to the cross and was crucified. In fact, Mark 14 verse 65 says, Then some began to spit on him, and to blindfold him, and to beat him, and to say to him, Prophesy! And the officers struck him with the palms of their hands. This is Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Son of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. It was God's only begotten Son that they began to spit on, to beat on. He was fulfilling God's will, but look what he had to go through. Job was in the will of God, and look what he went through. Unimaginable loss, unimaginable pain and sorrow, as close to hell on earth as you can get. And mind you, he went through all this despite the fact that the first thing we're told about Job in the Bible is that he was a man that was blameless and upright, a man who feared God and shunned evil. And here's the part that gets me. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man? one who fears God and shuns evil. God brought Job forward to Satan's firing line, and throughout everything Job went through, he was still in the will of God. Despite everything Jesus went through, he was still doing the will of God. Though there was pain, though there was sorrow, in their obedience to the will of God, none of them, not Job, not Jesus, were destroyed by what they went through. All of it, in the end, showed the goodness of God. For Job, we saw that even when your world comes crashing down and you lose everything, God can restore it and then some. With Jesus, we saw that even when everything looks to be over, when life looks to be over, oh, there is a resurrection power in God Almighty. When all doctors fail, when there is no cure, when you've tried all the herbs and remedies, you only need to touch the hem of his garment in faith and your life will change. When your own family betrays you or abandons you, you can sit there and cry asking God, why me? Or you can just ask Joseph and he'll tell you that even when his own kinfolk turned their back on him, the Lord never left him. I really need you to understand that if you're a believer, if you've received Jesus Christ as your personal savior, but you find yourself facing something, an issue, a problem, a job loss, heartache, it will be okay. It may not seem like it now, but keep trusting, keep believing, stick with God even though it's tough. If you leave now, where are you gonna go? 
who will you believe and trust to deliver you? Here's what the Bible says in Psalms 34, verse 19. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but, but, here's the game changer. The Lord delivers him from them all. There is no condition that the Lord will deliver you from these problems, but others, you'll have to figure them out for yourself. No, he delivers you from them all. That's, that's everything. Pain, emotional pain, physical pain, heartache. He will deliver you from them all. Stay obedient, stay faithful, and sure enough, God will lift you. Now I too, once upon a time, had the same idea that once I became a Christian, I would just be happy all the time. I would just be blessed all the time. Life would be good always, but that's just not the case. As I have grown and matured in my understanding as a believer, I have come to the realization that it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how righteous and upright you are. Your faith must stand trial. Your faith must be tested. You can say Jesus, but when trouble comes, you run everywhere but to Jesus. You can say, I have faith in God, but when the time comes for you to exercise your faith, it's non-existent. We all have to go through something, something that tests you. Problems that come only to ask one question. Do you really believe? Do you really have faith in this God of yours? Trials and tribulations come to all of us. There isn't a single person on this earth who has not been through some type of storm. But hear me, the difference is in Jesus. We are given the strength to endure. In Jesus, we are given the power to overcome. In Jesus, we are able to withstand the storm. Child of God, I want you to know that you were born to let the devil know, I win in Jesus Christ. And you lose, devil. You were born to let that situation know that with God on your side, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. Yes, you can make it. You can overcome those challenges. You're called to make a difference. You've been told, come out from among them. Stop seeing challenges as your enemy. Stop freaking out at the first sign of trouble. See challenges as an instrument that God uses to show himself to be mighty, good, and powerful. Many times we go through spiritual attacks, seasons of distress. But what are we to do when we're in a season of distress? When you've lost everything, when the Lord allows you to lose something you thought you needed. Let me tell you that I have the belief and mentality that if God allowed me to lose it, he will replace it something better in my life. I expect God to restore and replenish my storehouse. And when you believe like that, you will receive like that. Now, in order for restoration to happen, something must be destroyed or removed. That's the only way restoration will operate. God never had a plan for you that involved being defeated. When you call on him, he can make a way where there seems to be no way. And even then, just because you are going through trials and tribulations, that doesn't mean God is not with you. Regardless of the season you are in, God is still good. Hebrews 13 verse 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. One of the descriptions I love about him says, I am who is, who was, and who is to come. I have come to understand that true brokenness is going before God and admitting your weakness. 
One thing that we have to understand as children of God is that you can't live life on your own strength. And God never intended for you to do so. You can't live life on your own, no matter how resourceful you are, no matter how connected you are. And you know one thing that we have to be aware of? I have found that what often happens is that God will give us a breakthrough. He will bless us, favor us, but oh, how quickly we forget. How quickly we can get complacent and comfortable to such an extent that we forget the nights we cried, the fire in our belly, when we were praying before the breakthrough. We forget the hunger we had at the time that we were searching for divine intervention. But may I remind you, Matthew 16, verse 24 to 25 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. I believe Jesus is referring here to someone surrendering their life to follow him. And if you look closely at the requirements, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and be willing to give your life to Jesus. Such a person is someone who is in the state of brokenness. For you to deny yourself, you're getting rid of pride and selfishness. You are in a position of humility where you know that you need Jesus. You cannot be without him, his strength, his power, or his presence. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 says, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. This verse is talking about spiritual brokenness, the kind of brokenness God can use. A purged heart, a mature believer who knows that come what may, obedience to God is greater than anything else in this world. Godly sorrows are good for us because even though we are saved, our bodies are still of a sinful and carnal nature. And the struggle or sorrow is resisting your fleshly desire. You are denying yourself or earthly pleasures. For example, you are denying yourself of eating throughout the day and watching TV so that you may fast and pray in order to build a relationship with God. You are denying what makes you feel comfortable and stepping out to live in the will of God so that he can have his way over your own will. Even it makes you uncomfortable. True brokenness can be used by God to develop a good character in you, a strong prayer life, and a heart that is long suffering. And of course, he will always take you into his love. If God is disciplining you, be assured that there will be good to come from it. Somehow, some way, there will be good. Many believers have found that the worst things that happened to them were actually the best thing to have happened in hindsight. It doesn't feel like it at the time, but hold on in faith a little longer. Job certainly knows this. Do you remember the depths of his sufferings? When tragedy stuck Job and his family, he managed to keep holding on to his faith. That's all he literally had left, his faith. Job's wife couldn't, and who could blame her? Job's friends couldn't advise him. Job himself couldn't find a reasonable explanation for what had happened. But somehow he managed to say, 
God knows where I am going. And when he has tested me, I will come out as pure as gold. That's very hard to say when you're right in the middle of great hardship. We don't just begin to think I'm somehow being refined. I believe I will come out of this a better person. It is not our default thought pattern as humans, but I believe it should be our stance as believers. Job held on, and through that suffering, he came out as pure as gold. You can too. The writer of the Hebrews tell us, don't throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. That's what David found. He tells us there was a time when he was struggling. In Psalm 55, he writes, Fear and trembling overwhelm me, and I can't stop shaking. Morning, noon, and night, I cry out in my distress, and the Lord hears my voice. Then David says, this can be our experience also. At the end of the Psalm, he writes, Give your burdens to the Lord, and he will take care of you. He will not permit the godly to slip and fall. And we need to hold on to this. God will never let you slip. So I urge you, brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus is king, and he invites you to come to him for rest. The Bible says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Troubles can be a blessing for believers. You see, God uses our troubles to remind us that he is a deliverer. He is a savior. He is our hope and rescue. God is faithful to empower you to stand strong and victorious and not to be defeated. Understand that we are overcomers. The first principle to receiving a victory from God is to understand that he has already won. The battle has already been fought and he has already won. If we could only understand this, we have the victory. We have overcome, and yeah, it's a battle sometimes to be a Christian, but we know that Christ told us to take up our cross and follow him. As we do this, we receive the rewards of victory in Jesus. What do you do when you're lost and hopeless? Keep the faith. When there's no end in sight and the road seems long and lonely, keep the faith. When you're alone in the dark and in the den of lions, keep the faith. Faith isn't something that we can just muster up for ourselves. It is a gift from God, and God will never deny it to anyone who asks. Thankfully, when we're feeling discouraged and doubtful, we can simply pray for God to increase our faith. And the Bible tells us that God rewards those who seek Him. He blesses those who loves him and stand unwavering in faith. He stands with those that believe in him, those willing to believe even if they have not seen. He grants them victory even in the middle of difficulty. That is why we must keep the faith. We know that victory is up ahead, even if it's not as soon as we'd like. God's timing is not our timing but his way is always better. So every day when you wake up, believe that his hand is on your life. Do you know what characteristics mark society in the last days according to the Bible? Some of these characteristics are that people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without self-control. And as if that wasn't bad enough, the Bible goes on to say, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. 
Imagine that, picking worldly pleasures over God, appearing to be godly when in truth they don't really believe in the power of God? So this begs the question, how are you living? Each one of us needs to take the time to ask ourselves, am I living for God? Am I living to glorify Him? If the second coming of Christ was today, where would I be found when it comes to the state of my heart? God expects us always to be conscious of how we live. Are you conscious of how you live? Just as we are mindful of what we eat and whether it's healthy for our bodies or not, do you think about what you expose your spirit to and whether it's healthy or not? Do you weigh your decision about the type of music you listen to, the type of movies you watch? Are you paying attention to how you are living? I want you to be mindful of some of the little details when it comes to how you live your life. One speaker put it this way, we are all mind-driven because the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, as a man thinks, so he is. So I urge you to live your Christian life with pure thoughts, rebuke all that is impure, and cast down all corrupt thoughts. The truth is, you and I are not guaranteed one more day. Our time on this earth is brief. And because our time on this earth is brief, we must make the most of every opportunity to live right, to live with a fire for Christ. When you read the Bible, there is a promise that you will find to be repeated over and over again. This promise is delivered by different men of God throughout the Bible. The same message but different speakers. They are all saying the same thing, but in different ways. But before I go any further, I just want to speak for a moment about the use of repetition in Scripture. When repetition is used in the Bible, it usually emphasizes the importance of a person, theme, or event. And let me remind you that when you see something repeatedly said over and over again in the Bible, it's a sign that you need to pay close attention and take heed. Repetition in Scripture is not an accident. It's not some sort of mistake or coincidence. There is a purpose because scripture was divinely inspired, meaning there are no coincidences with God. God intentionally tells us what we need to know over and over again. And I believe repetition can be a tool that the Holy Spirit uses to awaken our hearts and highlight key messages. And with that said, there is a promise that I have found to be repeated multiple times in the Bible that I would like to remind you today. Apostle Paul spoke this promise in Hebrews 10, verse 37, and said, For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. John the Apostle said it too. In 1 John 3, verse 2, says it again. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And if you continue studying the Bible, you will find Peter proclaimed it, James proclaimed it. Even angels have also spoken this promise because in Acts 1, verse 10 to 11, when Jesus was ascending to heaven, the Bible reads, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly 
two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. But the most important person to have spoken this promise was Jesus himself. In John 14 from verse 1, he said to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. So multiple writers, different speakers, some even the angelic realm, all saying the same thing. Jesus Christ is coming back. Don't be distracted by this world. Jesus is coming back. Don't get too comfortable in this world. Jesus is coming back. Don't sleep on the word of God. Don't sleep on the promises of God. Don't ignore the signs of the times. Jesus is coming back. Like a thief in the night, the Lord is coming. And this message is repeated over and over again because the Lord wants us to go on living as if he were coming tomorrow to be on red alert. Be found to always be ready so that if he came tomorrow, if he came tonight, you and I wouldn't be embarrassed to be saying the name of Jesus, but not living for Jesus. Don't be found to be lukewarm. Get your house in order. So stay prayerful. Be watchful of the times. The Lord is coming soon. The rising king will be coming like a thief in the night. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And the Bible says in Revelation 16, Behold, I am coming as a thief in the night. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. God wants us to be on our guard against anything that deceives, against being led astray by false prophets and teachers. So in a time such as this, in a season such as this, I want you to know and remember the following points. Firstly, sin separates us from God. It takes us away. It removes us from his presence. So I encourage you to repent. Purge your heart now while there's still time. Ask God to purify your heart. Repent. We must seek forgiveness for our sins because God is faithful to forgive. Secondly, we cannot atone for sin ourselves. Nothing we can do on our own is worthy or enough to put us in the right standing with God. Only Jesus Christ. God sent Jesus to atone for our sins. We must confess Jesus as our Savior and live for Him. Invite Him into your heart. Pray that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you of all your sins. It can wash away all your guilt and shame away. Your past and mistakes, all can be washed by his precious blood. So my dear brothers and sisters, the knock of Christ is on the door, the door of your heart and the door of your soul. Are you ready to answer? Are you ready to pick up the call? I pray we all be ready for his return. I pray that we will purge our hearts in time. 
Get rid of those ungodly things. Remove those idols. Repent from that sin. So that when the Lord Jesus splits the sky, you and I will be among the pure in heart to be taken above. Revelations 22 verse 12 says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Time is ticking.